Aboard a pirate ship, food was vital for the morale of the men. William Dampier wrote, For it is generally seen among privateers that nothing emboldens them sooner to mutiny than hunger. However, sea rations were seldom tasty. As a basis, it consisted of flour, sometimes prepared into a rock-hard bread called ship's biscuit, and salt meat. A privateer named William Fennell wrote of this meat that the meat had been so long in salt that when we boiled it, it commonly shrunk one half. Fennell and his boys were forced to eat their meat raw, and it had the consistency of leather. As for bread, Fennell wrote that they ate raw flour scalded with hot water. Hardly a pleasant meal. Not only were these raw provisions disgusting, but the crewmen had to spend time cooking it. Eating it also took time. Rock-hard biscuit and leathery beef is not so easy to digest, and only a recipe for constipation. Enter the ship's cook. He could save the crew a lot of time by cooking food for them, meaning that they got more time to sail the ship efficiently, plunder, or just do silly fun things, such as fencing with wooden swords or playing music. Most importantly, the cook might actually prepare the disgusting rations into something kinda tasty. Flour could be made into a pudding, salt beef could be put in a stew, and biscuit was crushed into crumbs and used to thicken that stew. But uh, who was the ship's cook? The most famous pirate cook is the main antagonist of Treasure Island, Long John Silver. We know him well from his one leg and the parrot on his shoulder. While Silver is entirely fictional, he is actually more historical than you'd imagine. Pirates were quite common pets for sailors. In 1582, pirate captain Stephen Haynes even gifted a parrot to the Lord Admiral's cook. In the Navy, sea cooks were often veteran sailors who had been maimed out of active service, meaning that they couldn't receive a pension and retire. These cripples had to find other jobs aboard their ships. This famous illustration from 1780 depicts a British sea cook with only one leg. However, they seldom had any experience in cooking. All in all, sea cooks were often old or disabled veterans. Pirates also relegated cooking to other individuals that couldn't or weren't expected to fight. For example, cooking might be relegated to women, slaves or cabin boys. During his privateering voyage, Woods Rogers took aboard several black women to work as landresses, cooks and seamstresses. Captain Quelch forced a cabin boy named John Templeton to do all the cooking, and whatever the crewmen pleased. Templeton was an indentured servant, and his share of plunder went right to his master in Boston. Pirates could also force captured cooks to join them. When Blackbeard captured a French slaver, La Concorde, he forced the ship's cook aboard with him. No doubt he had a taste for garlic and baguette. Francis Spriggs forced a free black man to become his cook, and never made him sign the articles. This meant that the black cook was essentially a second-class citizen aboard a pirate ship. He wouldn't receive a full payment, and wasn't allowed to bear arms. Other cooks were treated even worse when captured. Ned Lowe, infamous for his excessive cruelty, took all the crew out of her but the cook, who, they said, being a greasy fellow, would fry well in the fire. So the poor man was bound to the mainmast and burned in the ship to the no small diversion of Lowe and his myrmidons. All in all, ship's cooks were kinda replaceable. They didn't need to fight, they didn't need prior sailing experience, only some basic cooking. I've never found a ship's article that mentions the cook, so he most likely received the same payment as the regular crewman. However, some pirate cooks were probably quite capable. Marcus Rediger claimed that 100% of cooks on merchant ships were literate, same as quartermasters. One of St. Bellamy's concert ships, the Marianne, had aboard a ship's cook named Alexander McConaughey, who was able to both steer the ship through a storm and read prayers for his illiterate crewmates, though in a thick Gaelic accent. Another ship's cook, Peter Rowlandson, was made gunner when he and his mutinous crewmates turned to piracy. The gunner earned a much better pay than the cook. The ship's cook was under the strict oversight of the pirate quartermaster, a powerful officer in charge of discipline and economics. It was the quartermaster's duty to issue the cook with raw foodstuffs. When the cook had prepared them into edible food, the quartermaster then rationed them out to the crew. On lawful ships, these duties befell the steward instead. Aside from buying or plundering foodstuffs, pirates frequently collected it themselves. Compared to merchant sailors who traveled long overseas expeditions, most pirates operated in tightly packed tropical islands, ripe with fresh fruit and game to forage. In general, their diet was better and more plentiful than the average sailor, and another incentive for new recruits to join them. In an upcoming series of videos, I will discuss the various foodstuffs that pirates ate, ranging from bread, meat and fruits. If the cook wasn't busy cooking, 
he was responsible for gathering food. Dampier writes that his crew turned turtles on their backs so they couldn't move, and sent ashore the cook every morning, who killed as many as served for the day. The pirates would also collect firewood and water. Firewood was only used in the cook room, and pirates boiled all of their shipboard meals. Cooking was done in the cook room, a cramped compartment usually located somewhere in the middle of the hold. It housed a few basic utensils, a working space and the fire hearth, a crude stove built from bricks or clay. The hearth was the only source of fire aboard the ship, and proved a major fire hazard. Careless cooking was a common way to set the ship afire, along with candles, smoking and burning strong liquors like brandy, something that sailors apparently did for the lols. Because of this, many hearts were moved to the open deck later on in the 1700s. This might have been done on smaller ships with only one deck, such as sloops. It's not impossible that undecked sailboats, such as Barquelongs and Piraguas, had fire hearts as well. After being shipwrecked, Nathaniel Erring escaped in a canoa that contained a small hearth. In South America, buccaneers encountered Indians that built canoes with hearts in their middle. However, it's most likely that pirates in open boats usually estate raw provisions. The hearth wasn't complex enough to do any baking, so we can presume that pirates never made their own biscuit and probably never ate any grilled or fried meat aboard the ship. On land they could do whatever. Instead, all of their cooked meals were boiled. Boiling was done in a large kettle, and the hearth wasn't large enough to hold more than one. Copper kettles were preferred over iron ones, since they cooked faster. Dampier wrote that the chiefest of their business was to get coppers. For, each ship having now so many men, our pots would not boil victuals fast enough, though we kept them boiling all day. However, copper kettles would leave a metallic aftertaste in some of the food, such as stewed peas, which some sailors disliked. Another cooking utensil was the cannonball, which one crew of French filibusters used to grind their mustard. The cook used other spices like peppers, pimento and dry herbs. The cook was also tasked with turning fresh food into rations. Turtle fat was rendered into oil, which pirates used as spread for their doughboys, a sort of dumpling. Pirates would also gather salt so they could cure meat and fish. At Madagascar, a group of pirates were unable to find salt to prepare rations with, and were forced to sell down on the island. After the cooking was done, it was the quartermaster's duty to issue it out to the crew. Crews were divided into units of four to seven men called a mess. You and your messmates worked together and ate together. Food was doled out in a wooden tub, which the mess ate from communally. They ate with spoons, knives under hands. Forks were not used. Sailors and soldiers from Portugal or Spain ate individually rather than in messes. They liked to view themselves as gentlemen, and their enemies gave them the ironical nickname Dons. Pirates sometimes ate on separate occasions throughout the day, rotating between working and relaxing. But for the most part, the entire crew ate together, while sailing was relegated to a skeleton crew. They ate wherever there was space and comfort. Gun decks typically had sheddable tables and benches between the cannons, where the messmates could enjoy their meal. During battle, the furniture was easily felled back up. Since provisions were usually readily available to pirates, they typically ate two or three meals a day, and every man was allowed as much as he wanted. Here's a menu from the merchant ship Adventure, that later mutineered and turned to piracy. On Sundays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, they had every mess a piece of good beef and pudding, besides butter or cheese for breakfast. That on Mondays and Fridays they had pork and peas, with breakfast as before. On Wednesdays and Saturdays, fish and burgoo, and they had burgoo for breakfast, with butter and sugar. Sometimes, pirates undertook longer voyages. In wider oceans around the Pacific and Africa, their quest for plunder often led them to bouts of starvation. Meals were cut back to once a day. The portions were strictly measured and rationed by the quartermaster. A captive amongst the Madagascar pirates wrote that they eat but once a day, and always with good appetite, for hunger makes the best cook. They are usually short of rations. Rationing usually applied to every man, officers too, but there were exceptions of discrimination. Woods Rogers employed a large amount of freed slaves aboard a ship, and though he promised to treat them like Englishmen, he could only allow six blacks the same ration as five of his own men, which was just enough to keep them alive. What did the captain eat? Aboard military and merchant ships, it was common to keep two cooks aboard. One cooked for the officers, the other for the crew. Aboard his privateering ship, Woods Rogers employed a ship cook named Bartholomew Burns, and an officer's cook named William Hopkins. One of the exclusive meals that Rogers enjoyed was mutton and cabbage. 
However, pirates saw themselves as kings above men. They voted for their captain and expected him to eat the same as them. During the Pacific Adventure, Bartholomew Sharp was forced to endure the same strict rationing as his fellow buccaneers. However, the pirates of the early 1700s gave more authority to the captain than the buccaneers. Bartholomew Roberts had his own cabin, where he drank tea from his own chinaware. On the morning of his death, his cook prepared a breakfast of salmagundi, a sort of salad consisting of meat, fish, eggs, and whatever you have available. Of course, salmagundi is easy to prepare in large batches, so it was likely eaten by the whole crew. Whilst Richard Taylor employed one of the most egalitarian articles, he ruled his crew with an iron fist. Bukoy writes at Taylor often, disregarding his prerogatives as captain, by coming down into the tween decks to converse, play, eat from the common pot, or drink with them. This indicates that Taylor usually ate separate food from his crew. We do know that Taylor had his cabin to himself, and that he would welcome guests inside for special occasions. So who was the ship's cook? Whoever was able to do cooking, and unfit to do anything else. Sometimes there were highly literate men who could sail ships, shoot cannons and read bibles. Other times there were young boys, slave women, or unfortunate souls forced to cook for the pirates. Many cooks were older men disabled in service, not all unlike the legendary Long John, with his one leg and parrot on the shoulder. A mastodontic super mega thanks to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Cole Freer, Max Dweck, 1660, Michael Jans, Rachel, Lockar, Dyer, Flintlock and Ted11. If you want to support me monetarily, please check out the links to PayPal and Patreon in the description below. This is what helps me fund my research and make better videos. Otherwise, please give the video a like and a comment so the algorithm will spread it to more potential viewers. And why not share it with a friend? Cheers. If you want more history, head over to my second channel, Baltic Empire, and check out the 50 minute documentary on Gustavus Adolphus, the Swede that almost conquered Germany and established the Protestant world order. This is my most ambitious video ever, featuring several wacky homemade animations and a really thoroughly researched script. Enjoy.